Hello, my name is Spiffy McBang, aka Sumo Spiffy, and I welcome you to this guide slash introduction to fantasy sumo wrestling. If you're familiar with fantasy league sports in general, the concept will be familiar. Just like you choose football or basketball players and score points based on their performance, in this case you choose sumo wrestlers and score points based on how well they do. The main difference is that whereas most fantasy sports are based on a wide array of statistics, sumo has only one stat that matters, wins and your goal is to pick wrestlers who win the most matches combined. If you've bounced around the existing sumo content on YouTube, you may have seen Sumo Stew's excellent primer on Fantasy League Sumo already. If not, there will be a link to it in the description, and I highly recommend you give it a watch, especially if the concept of fantasy sports in general is new to you. Now, this video will differ from hers in a couple of ways. First, where she discusses fantasy sumo leagues which mimic the type of fantasy sports many of us are used to, that is, leagues with a small number of people, and drafts which generally only allow one person to claim a given wrestler, I'm also going to discuss large-scale competitions where you're facing off against hundreds of opponents which allow you to necessarily choose whichever wrestlers you want, with some restrictions. Secondly, this video is designed to be a guide on not just how these different types of fantasy sumo work, but how to be more successful at them. Now first, with the assumption that some portion of the audience is quite new to sumo in general, I'm going to run through some ranking terms that will be used throughout the video. This way, we'll all be on the same page once we're into the meat of the topic. If you're familiar with sumo ranking terminology already, feel free to skip ahead to the next chapter. So, professional sumo involves hundreds of wrestlers who fight in tournaments, or bashos, spread across six divisions. These divisions and the ranks in them are listed on a rankings chart called the Banzuke. A wrestler will rise in the ranks, go up the Banzuke, if they have more wins than losses in a given tournament. This is called a Kachikoshi. If they have more losses than wins, or a Makikoshi, they go down the list. Reaching the top two divisions is a primary goal for most sumo wrestlers, as this is where they draw a real salary from the sumo association, as opposed to the pocket money they receive in divisions three through six. The second division is called Jurio, the top division is called Makuchi. The Makuchi division is the focus of basically all fantasy sumo. This division has 42 wrestlers ranked in the following order from lowest to highest. There's Maigashira, Komasubi, Sekiwake, Ozeki, and Yokozuna. Now another common term regarding ranks is Senyaku. It translates to three ranks, but it's inconsistently used to refer to either Komosubi and Sekewake, Komosubi, Sekewake, and Ozeki, or all four of the highest ranks. For simplicity's sake, Senyaku in this guide is used as a reference to all of the higher ranks. Maigashira wrestlers are broken down further into numbered ranks, from one through whatever they need to fill out the division. This can change as the number of Senyaku wrestlers changes. There are always 42 total wrestlers, so if there are 8 Senyaku wrestlers, there will be 34 Maigashira wrestlers. The number of Senyaku wrestlers can change for a few reasons. Promotions to Ozeki or Yokozuna, which are rare, but these are ranks that can have any number of wrestlers in theory. Ozeki demotions, which are also rare or temporary additional komasubi or sekiwake slots added when there are too many deserving wrestlers for the normal two of each rank to accommodate. Now, two wrestlers occupy each rank split between east and west. So if there are 34 Maigashira wrestlers, you'll see ranks from Maigashira 1 to Maigashira 17, with each having an east and west wrestler. The east wrestler is considered the higher ranked of the two, though the perceived difference between the two wrestlers of a given rank is minimal. If anything, the main difference at certain ranks is how the East and West wrestlers are scheduled. Now, this applies to the Senyaku ranks as well, Komasubi East and West, Sekiwake East and West, and so on. If there are more than two wrestlers at a Senyaku rank, you'll sometimes see them listed with numbers, such as Komasubi 1 East, 1 West, and then Komasubi 2 East, but realistically Senyaku wrestlers are just considered of that rank. Whether they're listed first or second, or East or West, isn't that meaningful. Reaching the Sanyaku level is an achievement that makes those minor differences pretty insignificant. Alright, that's all the terminology we need to talk about. You're here for fantasy sports, I'm here for fantasy sports, let's talk about some fantasy sports. Now the first type of competition that I want to talk about is the one with a lot of people in it, 
where you can choose whichever wrestlers you want, but the wrestlers are split up into different brackets. You get to pick one wrestler from each bracket. Now, there are a couple different types of competition within this style of Fantasy Sumo. One of them, if you're familiar with Jason's All Sumo channel on YouTube, he runs a competition like this every Basho. It's very straightforward. You pick five wrestlers, you get the most wins on all your wrestlers combined, you win the competition. I think he even sends out prizes, or at least he used to. But once the Basho is over, the Basho is over. You move on to the next one, and however you did on the one before, it doesn't really matter. Now, I also like a website called Kachi Clash. If you go to Kachi Clash, you can see the wrestlers are all split up in the brackets, it all looks the same, you pick five wrestlers, you try to get the best score, but on the main page, there's an overall ranking, and you can see there's Yokozunas, there's Ozekis, there's Sekiwakes, they use the Banzuke structure to rank everybody. The way this works is they take your total score from your last six competitions, so they total up your score for a year of sumo tournaments, and then they rank you accordingly. For the most part, for the most part, you still want to pick the same wrestlers regardless of which competition you're in. But the long-term nature of Kachi Clash can affect your decisions in some small ways. And we're going to get into why that is as I talk about this some more. But for now, let's discuss just generally how you want to try making your selections for this type of large bracket-based competition. There are three main pieces of advice that you really want to follow when you're playing in these types of competitions. Number one, understand that in sumo wrestling, there are very few big favorites in a tournament. Number two, when you pick your wrestlers, you have to remember that the skill of the wrestler is not primary. It's the skill of the wrestler compared to their rank. And finally, use wrestler histories if you don't know the wrestlers well enough to make these determinations for yourself. And I'll get into what those histories look like when we get to that part of the video. But let's start with the first point. There are very few big favorites. Now, you need to know right off the top that this is less of a strategic consideration and more of a mindset consideration. The reason I'm putting this first is that the most frustrating thing for somebody who is new to fantasy sumo is often the difficulty in figuring out which guy is going to pop off from a given bracket in a given tournament and how easy it is to get that wrong. If a bracket doesn't have anybody that really stands out as an obvious choice, you can give yourself a reason to think any of six or seven guys out of ten are going to be the one to do the best of the group in any given Basho. And obviously they can't all do that. In fact, some of them will end up with losing records even though you could see a way that they end up with ten or eleven wins. You're not misreading the wrestlers. It's just really hard to predict how they're going to do when they're fighting guys around their own skill level. So, when you play the game, make your picks, take a breath, and relax. If you do good, you do good. Congratulate yourself. It feels nice. And if your set of picks don't pan out for a given tournament, don't worry about it. You'll learn. You'll probably do better next time. Just chill out. Have a good time with it. It's all fun. Okay, let's get into the actual strategy now and move on to point number two. Picking the wrestlers who have the most skill relative to their ranks. Now, why is this important? A sumo wrestler's fight schedule is based largely on his rank. There is a point at which he starts getting matched up against other people based on his record, but even then, rank is taken into consideration most of the time. So if you have a guy who seems like his skill level would fit around Megashira 7, he's going to do great if for some reason he's ever at Megashira 15, and if he ever finds himself at Megashira 1, he's probably going to get annihilated. He hasn't changed, but his opposition certainly has. Now this matters less at the top of the Banzuke. Yokozuna and Ozeki wrestlers 
fight really the same group of guys, so you just want to pick the best wrestler of the bunch. Likewise, Komosubi and Sekewake wrestlers, if they're doing well, they'll fight largely the same group of opponents. So you kind of want to pick whoever you think is the best of that bunch as well. But once you get into the Maegashira ranks, rank matters a lot. You need to take that into consideration. But in order to do that, you still need to figure out what the quote-unquote appropriate rank for each wrestler is. Now, how do you do that? And that's where we get into point three, checking wrestler histories. However, rather than explain in general how to use wrestler histories to your advantage, I'm going to use the picks that you see here on Kachi Clash and explain how I came to the conclusion that these were my guys, and how I was able to pick some guys right on the money, the best ones in their brackets, and why in one case it didn't work out quite so well. Now, as you can see where I'm hovering here, there's a little link next to each wrestler. This will give you a web page where it shows you their lifetime tournament records. I already have that up here, so I'll click on that tab for Terra no Fuji, my pick for the Yokozuna and Ozeki bracket. Now, as you can see, you know, he was gone for a while, but since he's come back, since he's made it back to the top of the rankings, he has been absolutely dominant. Here you can see where he made it back to the top division. That's what the M means, M17E. 13 wins. Next tournament. He only had 8. He had to drop out. He got hurt. But after that, 13, 11, 12, 12, 14, 13, 15. It's incredible. Realistically, you can expect 12 wins out of this guy as long as he makes it through a full tournament. That makes him a tremendous selection. So if you're going to pick somebody besides him, you have to see something in their history to suggest that they're going to do even better. So let's look at those guys. A lot of people have thought Takakesho is going to be the next Yokozuna. He is an extremely gifted wrestler, and he's definitely got the capability to put up big numbers, as you can see here. The problem where you see all these dashes is where he's dropping out of tournaments. So he dropped out last July, he dropped out last January, he dropped out the July before that. That's not great. If a guy drops out of a tournament, he's not giving you any more wins. That's fatal to any chance you have of winning one of these competitions. Even when he finishes, 12 wins, 13 wins, tremendous. 10 wins, still really good. 12, you know, 8, not great, but it happens. 12. So as you can see, he is a very, very, very good wrestler, and he's capable of putting up great scores. But even when he does really well, his numbers don't quite approach Terra no Fuji's. To put it in a way that some of you fantasy fans will recognize, his ceiling is about at the level of Terra no Fuji's floor. And if your best can't beat the other guy's expected worst, you're not as good of a pick. So that's why not Takakesho. As for Shodai, I mean, you can see here, 8, 8, 9, 6, I mean, he's not good. He, he's really not a very good Ozeki wrestler. You expect a lot more from somebody at this level. He's just a bad choice, and he was going to be a bad choice until he drops pretty far back down the Bansuke where he figures out what he's doing. So Terano Fuji was an obvious selection in this case. And as you can see, most people went for him. Now, I'm not going to click on everybody for the Sekiwake and Komusubi ranks, but one tip I can give you is if there is one guy who is staying up in these ranks for a long time and just not dropping out, he is a good pick because these ranks often see a lot of turnover. And Mitakeyumi is that guy. If we look at his history, look at this. He made Komosubi in 2016. He immediately went down to Maegashira 1, and then from March of 2017, all the way until January of 2020, he was Komosubi or Sekiwake. He just couldn't quite get enough wins to push himself to Ozeki. He spent a couple tournaments at Maegashira, got back up to Sekiwake, and then spent from July 2020 all the way until January of 2022 
at one of those two ranks. That is an incredible run. His talent is undeniable, but more importantly, no one else came anywhere near this level of performance. He held steady while everybody dropped in and out of these ranks around him. He didn't necessarily have the best record of everybody in these ranks every single tournament, but he definitely was the safest bet to do a good job. But for this particular tournament, there was an even better reason to pick him. Now you see here where he was 9-6 and six and then 11-4. and four. Generally speaking, if someone is going to make Ozeki, they have to be a Sekiwake, and they have to win 33 fights in three tournaments. Well, 9, 11, he needed 13. Now that's a lot. That's basically, if you do that, you're probably going to win the tournament. But it's doable. Moreover, Mitakeyumi had been tagged as the next Ozeki for quite some time, and people were really starting to wonder if he was ever going to pull it off. He clearly had the talent, they just wondered if he had the mentality to make it happen. Well, when people are questioning sumo wrestlers and things like that, a lot of times it motivates them when it hadn't motivated them previously. And there was so much talk about, is he going to make Ozeki, is he going to make Ozeki, that even if he wasn't going to win 13 fights this time it seemed very likely that he was going to get 10 or 11 or 12 and give himself a good shot at Ozeki in the next tournament. And if you think a guy is going to win at least 10 fights, he's a good choice. Now, would you know that if you just looked at wrestler histories and weren't following sumo news? Maybe not. But these are the kind of things that, you know, if you're a sumo fan, you pay attention to this and that, whatever you hear, you might pick that up along the way. Use these pieces of knowledge to your advantage. And even if you don't follow sumo news and these numbers are all you have to work with, if you happen to notice that a second wake does a good job and you see these numbers and he's like, oh, he could make Ozeki next time, he might be a good pick in the next tournament because he may be energized by this motivation as well. Now, to talk about the Wakataka Kage pick, we should really talk about how schedules work in sumo. Arguably speaking, Maigashira 1 East, which was Wakataka Kage's rank in the last tournament, has the hardest schedule in sumo. So why is that? Well, his first fight is against an Ozeki, and his second fight is against the Yokozuna. From there, he has to fight everybody in the Sanyaku ranks early in the tournament. If he doesn't fight them in the first, in this case, seven days, since there were seven Sanyaku wrestlers, he'll fight them all by day eight or nine. Now, everybody from Maegashira 1 and two will fight all the Sanyaku wrestlers, and usually Maegashira 3 East will do the same. So why is it that Maegashira 1 East has the hardest schedule? Reason is, he fights them first. And that's tough, because these guys are fresh at the start of the tournament. And by fresh, I don't just mean they start to run out of energy later on. In fact, if they're doing well, sometimes you'll see people say, oh, they're rounding into form or what have you. The problem is injuries. The guys at the top rarely get there fully intact. You saw Takakesho's record. Every third tournament for the last couple of years, he's had to drop out. Terra no Fuji's knees are legendary for how bad they are. He's only had to drop out of one tournament, and that was only for three days since he came back in March of 2019. And frankly, that's almost miraculous. But even with this really good record of sticking in tournaments all the way through, that doesn't mean injuries don't affect him. As long as he's winning, he seems to do fine. But when he loses, that can get him knocked off the doyo. And if he gets knocked off the doyo with that big body and those knees, sometimes that can mess him up. This past tournament, on day 12, he fought Mese. He lost. He got launched off the doyo, landed on his feet, messed up his heel. This screwed him up for the last three days. Normally, you'd expect him to be able to handle Abi like he did in the tournament before. He lost. He could normally put up a pretty good fight against Matakiyumi. Matakiyumi handled him. The heel was clearly affecting him. And for the Yokozuna specifically, this is a big deal. Because if he had gotten hurt on day 6 instead of day 12, he might have dropped straight out of the tournament. A Yokozuna can't lose rank. And if a Yokozuna has a bad record over a tournament, he can be pressured to retire. So it's become not just acceptable, but normal for a Yokozuna who looks like he might be on his way, not even to a losing record, but even just to maybe not getting 10 wins, to just leave the tournament early. So everybody that he fought and beat along the way kind of got the short end of the stick. 
they had to fight him, they lost to him, and now their competition further down the road, they don't have to deal with that really difficult fight. So the earlier you fight him, the more this is a potential disadvantage for you. Wakataka Kage, as Magashira won East, was in the position where he was going to have to fight these guys and was, in fact, the only person that Takakesho beat in the whole tournament. On the flip side, Magashira 5 wrestlers generally only fight three or four of the Sanyaku wrestlers, although the Yokozuna is one of them, and they also benefit from having most of their fights against wrestlers at Magashira 4, 5, 6, maybe 7, whereas the Magashira 1 wrestler also has to fight the guys at 1, 2, and 3. So you would have to think that the Magashira 1 wrestler is way better than the ones at Magashira 5 in order to pick him, right? Well, in this case, that's exactly what happened. There's also another part of his record that I took into consideration on top of these pages that just have their overall records from all the tournaments that they've been in. And that is, do you see these black dots and white dots next to their names? The black dots are losses and the white dots are wins. Now, as you can see in this tournament, he started off pretty poorly. This is when he was fighting the Sanyaku wrestlers. But then he came back when he was finished with them and he had a bunch of wins. Now, before the tournament, I realized, wait a minute, I think I saw him do that last time. So I went to a different history page. Now, sumo.or.jp, if you just Google a wrestler's name, you can find this near the top of the list. They have this page for each wrestler, and it has not just their records for the tournaments, but also how they did against each person that they fought. And in the last two tournaments, when he had to fight everybody in the Sanyaku, he kept getting his ass beat by those higher ranked wrestlers. But then when he was against the Maegashira wrestlers, he was beating them all and coming back and ending with winning records. So I had to make a decision. Did I think that he was going to be able to do it again? I thought yes. And if he was able to do that, he'd you know finish eight and seven, nine and six, and that's pretty good. But if something were to change, did I think it was going to be more likely he would beat more Sanyaku wrestlers or he would start losing to the Maegashira wrestlers? And this becomes a matter of opinion, you know, watching some fights, whatever you think of the wrestler. In this case, I felt like he was likely to keep beating the Maegashira wrestlers, and maybe he'd get more Sanyaku wins, get, you know, 10, 11, 12 wins. In this case, he happened to just do the same thing for a third tournament in a row. Got nine wins, had the second most wins in his bracket. But then again, Onosho was a Maegashira 5. He seemed to be exactly in the position that... I would want to see a guy, a good wrestler, with a much easier schedule. So why didn't I pick him? Well, this is where wrestler histories are informative, but they don't guarantee anything. So if you look here, Onisho has been a Maegashira wrestler for a while. So you want to look for places where he's been in similar ranks. So Maegashira 6 wrestlers tend to have easier schedules than Maegashira 5, but they'll still fight a couple of Sanyaku wrestlers. So that's, you know, somewhat informative. And up here, in 2017, he went 10-5 and five at Maegashira 6. That's pretty good. Um, Maegashira 5, he wasn't in the tournament. 6, he went 4-11. and 11. At 6, 8-7. and seven. At 5, he went 5-10. and 10. At 6, he went 7-8. and eight. At 5, he went 9-6. and six. You know, that's fine. At 5, he went 7-8. and eight. At 6, he went 7-8. and eight. At 6, he went 10-5. and five. And then, you know, this was the last tournament. And... The problem here is that he's all over the place. Even if you only pay attention to the last year or so of results, which is what I generally recommend, he's got a lot of tournaments around this level, and he had 7 wins, 7 wins, and 10 wins. So which one is he actually going to do? Which him is going to show up at this tournament? There's no way to know. Wakataka Kage seemed like a much better bet to get a winning record, maybe a little extra, so that's who I went with. He got 9 wins, the best was 10 wins in the bracket, you know, I'm happy with it. Now let's talk about Abi. Abi is a pretty specific circumstance. And that is the circumstance of a guy who has dropped well, well, well below his skill level and rank. Now, why do these things happen? Usually it's because of injury. A guy gets really seriously hurt. You know, falls out of the top division, might fall to division three, four, five, 
and then works his way back, works his way back, works his way back. When he gets back into the Makuchi division, if he was a Sanyaku wrestler before, and now he's, you know, Maegashira 15 or whatever, he is probably going to smash everybody. At the very least, you can expect 9, 10 wins out of him, which is really good. So that guy is probably a good pick. Even if you're not sure about his recovery from his injury, you know, it, it doesn't matter that much because he's still fighting below his skill level. So just go with it. He's a good choice. Some guys will drop out of a tournament at high Maegashira and drop towards the bottom of the division. In those cases, you kind of have to make a judgment as to whether you think the guy has recovered from his injury or not. It can be really difficult uh, if you're an English language speaker only to get news about sumo wrestlers. So sometimes you just have to take a chance or make a guess. But if a guy has recovered and he is a Magashira 2 or 3 level wrestler and he's down at Magashira 14, you know, there's a good chance he's going to have a really good tournament. So he can be a good choice. Now, Abi, he dropped to Division 3 due to a COVID suspension. He was out for three tournaments. He never got hurt. He never suffered a major injury. And beyond that, he got to rest. So he was out for three tournaments. He actually dropped out of the tournament before halfway through. And then he had to fight some seven fight tournaments on his way back up because below division two, they only fight seven times instead of 15. So for over a year, he did not have to compete 15 times in a single basho. Now there's a lot that's been said about his new focus on sumo, but his rested body that hasn't gotten beaten up except in practice for over a year, that's gotta have an effect. I mean, regardless of the specifics, you know, he came back and he has been absolutely demolishing everyone. So the tournament before this, he was my Gashira 15. Everybody was picking him because they all knew that he was a much better wrestler than that. And he went 12 and 3 and challenged for the title. Now at my Gashira 6, so every step up from my Gashira 6, it gets harder and harder and harder because you have to fight more and more top ranked wrestlers. Well, at 6, he had about the easiest tournament that he could possibly imagine until and unless he were to challenge for the title again. So he kept winning and winning and winning, and he challenged for the title, and then he had to fight, you know, Terano Fuji and Matake Umi. But he was still way, way underranked for his ability. So he was an easy pick. Now, guys like this do not come along very often, as you might imagine. There are other COVID suspensions, but there's not that many. The next guy you probably want to look for who can benefit you in this way is Ryuten. He is going up to Jurio in March 2022, and he will be in Makuchi probably July or September of this year. The one after that is Asanoyama. Exozeki banned for six tournaments, probably going to drop to Division 4. So it's going to be a while before we see him again. But you know, if you're still a fantasy sumo fan at that time, grab him. Pick him as soon as you see him because he is going to absolutely steamroll everybody at the bottom of the division. So Abi was kind of an automatic choice. As you can see, you know, way more people picked Abi than everybody else in the bracket combined, and nearly everyone that didn't pick him picked Hoshoryu because Hoshoryu is extremely talented. Maegashira 6 is really too low of a rank for him, and you know, he performed really well, too. I mean, the fact that he kept up with Abi was really impressive. But, you know, Abi was an easy choice for that reason. So if you see those kind of off-the-wall situations where a guy is, for reasons outside of the performance of his last tournament, ranked way, way, way below where he should be, jump on him. He's a great pick. And now we come to my great failure of the last tournament, Aoyama. If you're a sumo fan and you've been paying attention for a little while, you may see that I picked Aoyama and think I must be an absolute idiot. This guy doesn't win. He has Makekoshis all the damn time. And this is true. I picked him for two reasons. One of them, wrestler history. The other one, the nature of Kachi Clash. He is a much worse pick outside of Kachi Clash, and I'll explain why. Wrestler history first. He's Maegashira 16 in this tournament, right? So look at this history. For the last couple years, he was like from 2019, 
five, seven, Komasubi, rank two, rank one, five, eight, 13. He was never ranked 16. He was never ranked 16. This is the lowest he's been in an extremely long time, since 2018. Not only that, he keeps putting up seven wins, six wins, six wins, and Mike Shear is seven, eight, ten. This guy has continually done okay at much higher ranks than he was at for this tournament. Also, when he has had good records in the last couple years, look when it happens. Mega Share 13, 11 wins. Mega Share 12, 11 wins. Every other not great record that he's had has been at a higher rank. So when he's dropped even further down, maybe he gets another 11 wins. Now, for some reason, he's done really good the last three March tournaments and just complete garbage the rest of the time. I have no idea why this is. Maybe it's the stadium that the March tournaments are held and he really likes it. No idea. Um, I did notice that and I thought, hmm, maybe it's January. Maybe this isn't a good pick. But at my share 16, for a guy with this kind of performance down in the lower end of the bracket, I figured he had to be safe for at least eight wins. Now, if I'm trying to win the competition, eight wins is probably not enough. This is a lot of wrestlers. Somebody's going to do better than that. But because it's Kachi Clash, and because, as I showed earlier, they total up your score for six tournaments running, sometimes you just need to take a safe pick. Sometimes it makes more sense to pick the guy who you're sure is going to get at least eight wins and might do better than the guy who's really hit and miss, the guy who is more high risk and high reward. In this case, we're talking about Katona Waka. Now, this guy was Magashira 14. Well, let's look at his history, because he's young. I mean, he's young, he's up and coming. You'd expect that whatever he's done in the past, he's probably going to improve bit by bit. So what have we seen? Well, at Magashira 18, he got nine wins, but at 13, he only got four, and he missed some of the tournament with an injury. Okay. At 14, he had seven wins. At 15, he had 10 wins. At 11, he had seven wins. But then at 11, he had 12 wins. And then at 11, he had six wins. This guy is all over the place. This guy was as capable of winning 12 matches as five matches. So what are you going to get from him? Well, he was definitely the pick if you just were going for it. And a lot of people went with him. As you can see here, more people picked him than anyone else in the bracket. They were going for it. I am taking a more long view. I didn't want to take the risk, and obviously in this case, it didn't pay off. Now, Ishira, well, why not him? It's very simply, he's just never done this before. His entire history, from Juryo to Maegashira, for all of this time, he never had 11 wins. Not in Division 2, not in Division 1. This is the best he's ever done, and the 4-4 four four record he had for the first 8 days is a lot more indicative of how he tends to fight than the 7 straight wins he had the rest of the time. So, the people who picked him, good for them, they got lucky, he's probably never going to do this again. So, that's really everything that I've got to talk about with these large-scale competitions. Uh, as I mentioned, there's a little bit of a difference if there's a long-term goal, like with Kachi Clash, versus just a short-term competition, like with Jason's All Sumo channel. From here, I am going to move on to Sumo Stew's video and talk about draft leagues. Now, for the most part, you want to deal with the same types of advice. Uh, you want to look at the best wrestlers, you want to look at the best wrestlers relative to their ranks, and then you want to look at these wrestlers' history so that you can figure out the best draft targets. Now, if you're familiar with fantasy football, you probably know about the usually three different types of rule sets that most people use. There's regular, there's half PPR, and there's PPR. For those who are not familiar with fantasy football, PPR stands for points per reception. So essentially, the rule sets change so that either you have regular, where wide receivers get points based on yardage only, PPR, where they also get a point every time they catch the ball, and half PPR, where they get a half a point every time they catch the ball. In the same vein, there are different ways that these draft leagues set up their rules, so we're going to mostly talk about that so you can decide what draft rule set you like the best and find a league that matches your preferences. So the first thing I want to talk about is the number of wrestlers you have on each team. 
this will equal the number of rounds in the draft. Now, a normalized number of wrestlers per team, probably due to the large-scale competitions online, is five. The problem with this is that if you do a snake draft, where you draft one through five and then five through one, the person in the number one slot gets the first pick three times in rounds one, three, and five, and the person in the five slot gets the first pick twice in rounds two and four. Now, the reason that that's a problem in these drafts is that there are two methods of drafting set up, free-for-all and underdog. If you use free-for-all, you can pick any wrestler at any time and just make up your team from whoever you're able to get. Obviously, this gives the advantage to the people who pick first, because they can pick the Yokozuna, the high-level Ozeki, you know, whoever is really looking like they're going to be dominant. And this is always going to happen. You can't get away from it. Whoever gets the first pick in the draft has some kind of advantage like this. If you use the underdog draft style, the way that works is you have to pick a low-ranked wrestler first, and every wrestler after that has to be higher ranked than the one before. But even in this case, if there's an odd number of rounds, the person in the first slot has the advantage because they have the first opportunity to finish off their draft with the highest ranked wrestler available. One way in which this isn't too bad is if you plan on playing with the same people for several Bashos in a row, you take the results from one tournament, reverse them, and then that's the draft order for the next tournament. So if you finish last, you get to draft first next time. Over the long term, that should balance out the results, but for any given tournament, if you have an odd number of draft rounds, it's going to benefit the person picking first unless there's a significant knowledge gap between the players. So if you're new to draft leagues and you're just trying to find one to play in and you have no idea if you're going to like it or not, I would recommend trying to find one with an even number of wrestlers per team and an even number of draft rounds because then you're likely to end up with a more balanced experience. The other main rule is the question of injury subs versus no subs. Basically, if one of your wrestlers gets knocked out of the Basho due to injury, do you get to replace him? This is really a matter of personal preference. You can play one way, you can play the other. Both of them are perfectly legit. Just keep in mind that the fewer wrestlers that are drafted in total, the stronger this ability becomes. In a league with 5 players and 5 wrestlers per team, 25 wrestlers get drafted. If you have somebody get knocked out due to injury, then you have 17 more to pick from. If you're in a league with 5 players and 6 wrestlers per team, then if somebody gets knocked out, you only have 12 to choose from, and most of them are probably not going to be that good. These are the only two options offered by the spreadsheet that's used on the Discord server that Sumo Stu linked. But if you're willing to keep track of things manually, there's another way you can do this that kind of splits the difference, and that's this. Have a team of five wrestlers, but draft six. Once you draft six, only the top five count for the tournament. This gives you a little bit of play in case you have someone get hurt or somebody who does a really terrible job, and it's very straightforward and easy to understand. If you're in a group that would prefer to only allow an injury substitute, you could use this where you have to pick one of your wrestlers to be a sub and only a sub, and is only counted if and when one of your other wrestlers is removed due to injury. If you're doing this manually, this might be a little more complicated, which is why I'm suggesting just have the top five count for your score, but you can do it either way and it should be fine. The only suggestion I have as far as draft strategy goes is that if you're really confident in a couple of the guys that you pick early, you might be better off not taking any risks later and just finding guys who you think can get you a safe eight wins. The guys who are going to get you a Kachikoshi, who aren't going to screw up your team, who aren't going to drag you down despite the best efforts of your top wrestlers. And with that said, we're going to move on to one more type of fantasy competition, and that is daily predictions. Now, here we can see the appropriately titled Sumo Game. It's at japan-guide.com sumo, and this is the only game of its type that I'm aware of. But you could certainly do this in leagues with people. You might be able to find other websites that do this. Um, the basic idea is that you are picking guys to win fights every day as opposed to picking wrestlers on the basis of how they're going to do for the Basho overall. The way this game works is that you're matched up with a different person every day. Your picks go against their picks, and whoever gets the highest score for that day gets a win. Your record is what matters, not the total points you score for the entire tournament. 
there's a bonzuke, which we can see here, and it works just like a regular sumo bonzuke. If you get eight or more wins for a tournament, you go up for the next one. If you get seven or fewer wins, you go down. As you can see, as we scroll through this, you've got the first division, you've got the second Jiryo division, you've got Makushita, the third division. And when you start playing sumo game, you'll start out down here at the bottom. The game is really straightforward. As you can see here, you have a member page where you make your picks. And before the tournament, you'll pick a list of 10 wrestlers who will act as your default. You can change this along the way, but for right now, you can see I've got 10 wrestlers. Don't pay too much attention to which ones I picked or the order that they're in. I really just did it to have an example ready. Each day, you'll come here and you'll make new picks, and those will be your picks for that day. If you want to change your default picks, you can make the picks for a given day your prediction for the rest of the tournament. Now your default predictions are what will be used if you don't go in and make specific predictions for a given day. And what some people do is they'll stay with one set of predictions for the entire tournament. Now that's a valid strategy and it can work, but it's got some weaknesses. You can probably figure out right off the bat that you have one weakness of your guys are probably going to fight each other eventually. You would want to switch off of one of them, but if you're not changing your picks at all, you know, you've got a hole in your lineup. It's not that bad. You are guaranteed one win, not just guaranteed one loss, but obviously it's not exactly optimal. There's not a ton of overall advice that I can give as far as making your daily picks. It's dependent on matchups. You have to have an idea of how the wrestlers do. Most wrestlers have a fairly even record against each other, so you're not going to find a lot of really easy to pick matches, except for the ones where, you know, you've got your Yokozuna or some Ozeki who are fighting lower rank competition. Because of that, what I'm going to do is make short videos each day of the Basho with some really good picks that I see for the day that's coming up. What I can show you now is how to potentially take advantage of the people who only make one set of picks and let it run for the entire tournament and never come back and change anything. If their entire lineup is still in the tournament, you really just have to play them normally, but if any of their wrestlers have dropped out and they haven't come back to remove that person from their lineup, you can almost guarantee yourself a win. It's based on the site's tiebreaker rules. If you and your opponent have the same number of correct picks, then the winner is whoever has the winning pick at whatever point in the lineups, one of you has a winner and one of you has a loser. So you're looking at my default picks here. So let's say Taran Fuji wins and the other guy's first pick wins. Mitake Yumi wins, the other guy's second pick wins. Abi loses, the other guy's third pick loses. Kotono Waka wins and the other guy's fourth pick loses. So now I have the tiebreaker because I am the first one who had the winner in a spot where one of us won and one of us lost. Now, I'll switch to the results of a match from the previous Basho where this came into play. So you can see here the score was 6 to 6. Terano Fuji, we both had him first, and then I had Mitakeyumi who won and he had Takakesho who lost. Now this was day 13, obviously Takakesho hadn't been in the tournament for a while, so this is one of those people who hadn't come back to change their picks at all. So this is how the strategy works. You make nearly every pick the same as theirs. That way, you're guaranteed to have the same score as theirs. The fault picks can't beat the ones that you think are going to do good on that day. You look for the spot where they have the wrestler who's out of the tournament. Find a wrestler that you both have below that guy. You want to find the one that you think has the best chance of winning. Now, given that this was a January 2022 Basho, Mataki Yumi is a really good choice. Move that wrestler up across from the one that's out of the tournament. Then replace him with whoever's left in the tournament that you two haven't selected that you think has the best chance of winning of anybody. Hey everyone, Future Spiffy here with an edit and a correction. What I was explaining was a way to almost guarantee yourself a victory, but there is in fact a way to completely guarantee yourself a victory in this game against somebody who's running on autopilot and has a wrestler who's out of the tournament. Somewhat embarrassingly, I used that exact strategy in the example I'm showing you now. I just forgot about it at the time I did the original recording. You start with the same strategy. 
You find the person that your opponent has who's out of the tournament and move one of your wrestlers up into that space. And then you replace the empty space with somebody else. But you don't just pick whoever you think has the best chance of winning. What you do is choose the wrestler who's fighting the one that you moved up. That way you're guaranteed a win and a loss. The way this works out, if the wrestler you moved up wins, then you're going to finish with a tie, but you'll have the tiebreaker. If that wrestler's opponent wins, then you'll just win outright by one. In this particular example, you can see that we had a 6-6 match because Matakiyumi won and we both had him on our list, but if Matakiyumi had lost, his score would have gone down by one and mine would have stayed the same because Abi would have gotten the win instead. So, if you're in this position, move a wrestler up, put that wrestler's opponent in the empty slot, and profit. Now back to past Spiffy and the rest of the fantasy guide. As far as figuring out who these people are, you get at least a day's notice of who your opponent for any given day of the event is going to be. So you can click on their name, see the matches they've had up to that point, and as long as you're at least a few days into the tournament, you should be able to tell if this is somebody who's coming back day after day and changing up their picks, or if they're just sticking with the same group of guys for the whole thing. All right, and that is going to do it for this guide to fantasy sumo. I expect this is the only guide of this type I'm going to make. However, I will make guides for each basho as the bonzuke for that specific tournament comes out. Like I said, I'll also make daily guides for the pickums. So I hope you found this informative, maybe even enlightening. Good luck with your fantasy sumo exploits, and I'll see you in the next one.